This is the Alpha Human Podcast, and I am your host, Lawrence Rosenberg. Our guest today is Joanna Zeiger, who competed as a professional triathlete from 1998 to 2010 and is an Olympic trials qualifier in three sports, marathon, triathlon, and swimming. While training for the Olympics, Joanna earned a PhD in genetic epidemiology from John Hopkins University and would ultimately achieve a fourth place finish at the Sydney Olympics in 2000 and go on to become the 2008 Ironman 70.3 world champion. Joanna is also the founder of Race Ready Coaching, where she mentors endurance athletes in running, cycling, and triathlon, and she is the author of The Champion Mindset, an athlete's guide to mental toughness. Joanna is also the founder of the Canna Research Group, a consortium of researchers and medical professionals who study the relationship between cannabis and chronic pain. Joanna, welcome to the show. Lawrence, thank you so much for having me on. It's my pleasure. It's my, um, uh, you know, I'm just blown away by the fact that in reading your book, I understand you wrote 75% of your doctoral dissertation while in Sydney preparing for the Olympics. I mean, talk yep. about mental toughness. Uh, that, that is a true fact. Uh, we, uh, so the, tri the women's triathlon was the first event of the Olympics. Mm -hmm. And the 2000 Olympics was the first time that the triathlon was actually contested in the Olympics. We got to uh, Australia quite early to acclimate to the, the time change. Okay. So we had, a lot of, we had a lot of time on our hands. And there's, and there's only so much swimming, biking, and running you can do during the day. Okay. Uh, we were tapering for the event. So even though my taper was a little different than uh, my uh, cohorts who were there with me, my teammates, uh, I tended to train on the higher side of things because I also competed in the longer distance events. The Olympic triathlon is about a two-hour event. Mm -hmm. And I also competed in the Ironman, which is closer to nine and a half hours. Uh, so we, we had a lot of time on our hands and there wasn't much to watch on TV. You could either watch the torch make its way across Australia, right. or you could watch the U S open, which happened to be on TV. And so I decided that this was a good opportunity to write my dissertation. Uh, listen, I, I hear you. It, it's still, uh, pretty impressive because these days, you know, you really, uh, have a look at athletes and how specialized everyone is. And, you know, the, the world gets shut out uh, and they go into a training camp and nothing else is focused on but the training. So the fact that you could do both um, is, is pretty powerful. So just, uh, just great stuff. And we'll delve into mental toughness uh, as well. I want to talk about that uh, clearly, given your background. But I also want to kind of uh, do a bit of a, a deep dive into the champion mindset, your book, not from the perspective of endurance sports or even athletics as a whole, but as, as a blueprint for achieving anything. I, I really think that your book has some incredible uh, insights for accomplishment, uh, the achievement of goals, and of uh, reaching uh, success and how to get there. So uh, it's powerful stuff. I've, I very much enjoyed the book. Uh, I'm going to start by uh, quoting you uh, from the book. And it's, it's where you talk about, I think, one of the, uh, the you know, the qualifier where you, where you did qualify for the uh, Sydney Olympics, because I think it kind of sets the stage uh, so that the audience can get a sense of who you are and kind of the, the, the mindset that you have, where you're coming from. So uh, I'll, uh, I'll begin. Memorial Day weekend, 2000, Dallas, Texas. It was the first ever U.S. triathlon Olympic trials. The triathlon was to debut in September at the Sydney Olympics. And I came out of the water in a group of 13 women, 60 seconds behind the two lead women, Sheila, Tormina, and Barb Lindquist. The two in the front rode like they were in a perfectly practiced ballet. Their synchronicity was in stark contrast to the pell-mell of our group of 13. We couldn't get organized. 
indeed, it almost seemed like there was an intentional slowing down of our group to provide the front runners with more of an advantage. By the time we hit the transition to the run, we were almost four minutes in arrears to Sheila and Barb. Four minutes! That is essentially an eternity in triathlon parlance. Over a 6.2 mile run, that equates to roughly 40 seconds per mile. Making up that amount of time is virtually unheard of at that level. When my feet hit the ground, I scrambled through the transition with those numbers floating through my head. I was angry. Angry that our group of 13 could be so complacent. Angry that I was now racing for an alternate spot. Angry that my favorite hat had flown off within the first two minutes of the run, and now the sun was relentlessly beating down on my head. I tried to ignore the oppressive heat and humidity and the fact that two days before the race, I'd had to sit down on a park bench in the middle of a short, easy run due to the dizziness from the Texas swelter. I settled into a rhythm. I ran hard. I ran off my anger. Within two miles, I started hearing that Barb was faltering in the heat and that I had a sizable gap to the women behind me. Suddenly, the impossible became possible. As halfway through the run, I was in second place in contention for a coveted Olympic spot. All I had to do now was stay hydrated, stay calm, and not succumb to the heat and the excitement. The home stretch was long and crowded with spectators who cheered for me as I made my way across the line. I raised my arms in jubilation. Years of training, injuries, dealing with asthma, and the complexities of being a student athlete all came into focus. None of it mattered anymore. I was an Olympian. Now, that, that's a really powerful uh, story. That's a really powerful vignette in, in the book that you wrote. And I wanted to, I wanted to kind of ask you, um, you know, you talk about running off your anger. And I, I'm curious, did you mean that you ran off of anger as if it was a fuel? Or did you mean that you burned off your anger because you were so focused on catching up? I think it's both. I was, I was angry, but as I mentioned that, uh, I was angry that we had allowed ourselves to get beat so badly on the bike by the two people in front of us. And that made me very angry. And I, and I knew that there was uh, some monkey business going on in our pack with the intentional slowing. And that made me angry as well. So I ran that off. But I also said to myself, you, it doesn't matter, that, that's done and gone. And so I, I have to let that go. And, you know, you, you can't be saying you're running for an alternate spot. You're in a race here. You have to run right. for your life because anything right. can happen. And, uh, you know, I had that epiphany. Um, even before I had heard that Barb was faltering, I had the epiphany of the fact that we're in a race and you never know what happens. That's why you race. You know, all the pundits can say what they want to say, but until the winner crosses a line, you don't know who won and anything can happen. And so I sort of was able to refocus that and, and not be angry anymore. And I just ran with a vengeance and, and just put my head down and said, hey, this is my race now. I'm in control. Uh, I don't have the pack to contend with. I only have myself. So um, in the heat of the moment, when you guys- lit, lit The literal heat of the moment. It was so hot that day. It was ridiculous. <laughs> right. In the oppressive heat of the moment, were you, uh, being so far behind, being so angry at it all, did you, because you then say suddenly the impossible became possible. Did you at that point believe it was impossible for you to catch up, let alone, and, and qualify or- you know, or did you think it was still possible? Or were you just running because that's what you do, you're a competitor? Initially, I thought it was impossible. I didn't, I didn't think that there was a possibility to catch up. And that's negative self-talk. Okay. Um, and, and one of the things I tell people is that negative self-talk is natural. 
If you stub your toe, you're going to have some yeah. negative self-talk. If you get a flat on the bike, you're going to have some negative self-talk. What, what champions are able to do is take that negative self-talk and rewrite the script into something more positive. And that's what I was able to do. I didn't think about it anymore the time gap. I just thought, you just have to run. And you just have to run as hard as you can run without putting yourself in danger of faltering in the heat. And I didn't think about placement anymore. I just thought about run as hard as you can. Powerful, powerful. So, okay. So let's get a little backstory here. What led you to uh, compete in the Olympics or to uh, go into those qualifiers? What led you to become a competitor in uh, triathlon, let alone you know, running, cycling, swimming? Where did all this start? Where did it come from? Well, it all started with swimming. Okay. I, uh, we moved to San Diego from the East Coast uh, when I was six years old. And my parents decided, well, we're in California, better get the kids some swimming lessons. <laughs> oh, yeah, so okay. I, I, I took some swimming lessons and the club that we belonged to had a swim team. Okay. The first time I decided, the first time I tried out for the swim team, I actually didn't make it. They said, you need more swim lessons. So by the time I turned seven years old, I uh, went to my first swim practice. And I think in the middle of the practice, I said, mom, I'm ready to get out. And the coach said, there are no mommies here. You get out when I say you get out. And that was sort of my introduction to sports, uh, wow. was, was swimming. Okay. And I just kind of progressed from a terrible swimmer who didn't think that there was any potential uh, even in, uh, at the age of 12 and 13, when a lot of swimmers are already established and have um, made themselves known as uh, being a great competitor, I still hadn't really hit my stride. Uh, and then something sort of changed, and I don't really know what it is. Um, you know, maybe it was a coaching change. Maybe mm -hmm. it was just uh, I realized how much I loved the sport. Maybe I realized I did have some potential, but uh, I started improving I think some of it also was that I'm not a sprinter. And when you're young, you know, all the events are short. And as I got older, I started competing in the longer events. And I found that I actually did have potential and capacity for swimming. Uh, my senior year of high school, I had decided that my goal was to qualify for the 1988 Olympic trials. And I put every single effort into it. I missed yeah. one practice the entire year, and that was to take the SAT. And I qualified in two events. I qualified in the 200 breaststroke and the 400 IM. Going yeah. to the Olympic trials was, um, I mean, I'd been to junior and senior nationals, but this was just a huge eye opener for me. Um, just seeing people, and I, I never had aspirations to be an Olympian uh, when okay. I was growing up. A lot, of, a lot of kids growing up swimming are like, oh, I want to go to the Olympics. But I, I right. knew I wasn't a good enough swimmer to do that. And so it just wasn't really on my radar. To me, it was, let's get to the Olympic trials. Okay. But when I got to the Olympic trials and I saw what was going on there, my goodness, it just changed my whole perspective on sports and what the human body can do and what, what mental toughness means and the, the difference between those who could make it and those who didn't. It, it was really a life-changing moment uh, being at that, that swim meet. Wow, wow. Um so, you know, you kind of have this new perspective entering this, uh, this zone of elite competitors and seeing what goes on there. What was it? Was, was there a certain energy in the air? Was there a certain mindset that you were picking up on? Um, what, was the, what was the common thread throughout that you were seeing amongst these uh, elite level athletes? It was the tenacity. It was the hard work that people had put in, the excitement of those who made the team. It, it, it was the, the, the thrill of victory and the agony of defeat. It was all right there. You know, mm. there was uh, one woman who uh, missed a spot in like three events, just, you know, came one spot short in three events. And that, that just was devastating. I felt so bad for her. Mm. And then it was seeing other people just tear the pool apart it was seeing people who weren't expected to make the team make it. it people who should have made the team not make it. Anything can happen. And it just, it was, 
it was not like anything I'd ever seen before, live and in person. And being able there, being able to witness it, especially, you know, I had just graduated from high school. I was gonna uh -huh. be a, a freshman in college. Uh -huh. it, it really changed my whole attitude about everything. And so did that, so did that further inspire you to, to, to continue on and to kind of press on and do, uh, because from there you, um, you ended up uh, being in the first triathlete or triathlon qualifier for the Olympics, right? When was that? A few years later? 2000. So it's 12 years later. 12 so years, had, excuse me. So I had a, a, a big gap in between, but it definitely, um, you know, as I went off to college, it, it gave me a, a work ethic. I was always a hard worker okay. um, once I hit my stride with swimming. Um, I was a hard worker already. But when I went to college, I just put my head down and I, I just was not going to leave any of my potential untapped. So you're, so now you're kind of overachieving in sports, but you're also overachieving academically. You end up getting a master's degree uh, in genetic counseling. Uh, what, what did you get your uh, uh, what, a bachelor's of science in, in what? I, uh, bachelor of arts in psychology. That's what, so you get a so you get a BA in psychology, then you go on to get the master's in genetic counseling. By the way, what is genetic counseling? Genetic counseling uh, takes many forms. Uh, the most, I would say, the most common way that people get genetic counseling are women who are what they call advanced maternal age. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, women who are a little bit older and are pregnant and are at risk for having children with chromosome abnormalities. Okay. Uh, you could also talk to families who have a history of uh, genetic illness, uh, or uh, I actually did a rotation in a pediatric clinic, so it's working with families who have kids with genetic disorders. Um, there are uh, a lot of ways, uh, cancer, you know, genetic counselors often work with cancer patients. Okay. So gen genetic counseling comes in many forms. Uh, although I did get my master's in genetic counseling, I never practiced genetic counseling because mm -hmm. I went straight to get my PhD. And that was in genetic e epidemiology, Ep correct? Co correct. Right. <laughs> um, I, was, I was very interested in research. So uh, when I chose my, uh, the school that I went to to get my master's, I wanted to choose a program that had a research requirement. And I went to Northwestern okay. and that was one of the requirements there. Uh, I just, I loved research. My father is a researcher. so. I was exposed to it at a young age. And uh, ironically enough, now my father and I do research together. Wow. Uh, and so I decided to go on for my PhD immediately. Uh, one of the major reasons why I did so was because I didn't want to have to take the, retake the GRE and it was going to expire at some point. So I just decided I better, I better just go on right now. I got good scores and uh, let's just uh, move right along. Yeah, I mean, again, extremely impressive that you're following a very uh, intense academic track whilst following, you know, the, the most elite form of, uh, of athletics, whether it be uh, at the amateur level or also eventually, uh, you know, competing professionally uh, in, the, uh, in, in the triathlon. Um, so let me ask, what were you, so what were you, um, in, do, in, in competing, you know, kind of what were you seeing as your goal eventually? Because you, as you said, you, you know, growing up, you, you didn't think to yourself, I want to be an Olympian, but you did go to that Olympic qualifier and you, you know, it just changed your perspective on everything. From that moment on, were you determined to make it to the Olympics or were you looking or, or, or was still that not your, your goal as an athlete? That was still not my goal as an athlete. So that's interesting. Uh, that's because, re that's, that's yeah. really interesting. Well, because as I said, I knew I didn't have the potential as a swimmer to, okay. to be an Olympian. So I, I went to Brown University and mm -hmm. my goal in college was just to swim as fast as I could possibly swim. Like okay. what, what is my potential? I, I just, I didn't know. Okay. And when I was in college, I, um, I started off the first year doing my two best events from high school, which was a 200 breaststroke and the 400 IM. I okay. ended up with uh, an injury in my groin. 
and I changed to distance freestyle and I set school records in the 500,000 and 1650. Realized I had a great capacity for uh, distance swimming. Wow. Um, but again, it wasn't like, gee, I'm going to go to the Olympics in swimming. I just wasn't good enough. And I knew that. And okay. at that time, I didn't really know much about triathlon. That wasn't on my radar yet. Okay. I, didn't start doing, I didn't start doing triathlon until after I graduated from college. And at that time, I didn't even know that triathlon was an Olympic sport. I was an amateur. I was having fun with it. Okay. Um, I was good uh, right from the beginning. I won my first race that I did. I won my age group in my first race and placed in the top five overall. So I understood that I had capacity uh, to do well in triathlon. I raced as an amateur for many years. Okay. And in 1997, uh, I was now in Baltimore pursuing my PhD. Okay. Uh, I had a, a sort of a banner year as an amateur. I won my age group at the Olympic Distance Nationals. And I also won my age group uh, at the Ironman World Championships. So I have an age group world champion. And I also placed ninth overall. So I beat all the pros, uh, except for just a very few. I, it's uh, rare for an amateur to place in the top 10 overall. Wow. So I had a dilemma to, you know, at that time because I am getting a PhD, mm -hmm. but I'd sort of reached the pinnacle of what I could do as an amateur. And okay. I had a decision to make. Do I turn professional or do I stay amateur? And I decided at that time, well, I guess I'll turn pro and see what I can do. And it's, I'm not signing away my life and blood that if it doesn't work out, that I can't go back to being an amateur. Right. So I decided to take that leap of faith and turn pro. And even at that time, I still didn't know that triathlon was an Olympic sport gotcha. when I turned pro. And once I got my professional card and started competing on the pro circuit, that's when I sort of learned about triathlon being in the Olympics. And I got an education from some of my competitors. And I started doing the races that you had to do to uh, even be able to qualify for the Olympics. I did not enjoy those races. So there's sort of an, a difference between uh, Olympic style racing, mm -hmm. which is uh, you ride in a pack, like in the Tour de France on the bike, uh, you ride in a group. Mm -hmm. And uh, my preferred style of racing was where you time trial, you ride by yourself. Gotcha. And so I had this sort of um, conflicting thing that was going on inside of my head of, you know, I have to, if I want to go to the Olympics, which now seemed like a possibility, all of a sudden, you know, after all of my years as an athlete, um, you know, now I'm thinking, gee, this might be a possibility. And when I went to uh, my first uh, world championships as a triathlete, and I placed in the top 15, the American coach came up to me and said, I think you're going to make the Olympics, wow. which was a huge confidence booster for me but I hated that style of racing. And the other conflict that I had was I really enjoyed the long distance more than the short distance. I had already done an Ironman. I'd been to Kona and that was sort of my preferred distance. So I had a lot of dilemmas that were going on, but the Olympics were just looming. Right. And like the Olympics for the Olympics. And so I did these races I didn't like because I, I wanted to go to the Olympics and I did do well at that style of racing. Amazing. So um, when you do eventually um, do the qualifier, do I have this right? I mean, was that your second, was that the second time you attempted to qualify for the Olympics, the first time being 12 years earlier? Correct. So the way that it worked in that Olympic cycle, and things are different now, things have very much evolved Okay. Uh, in the world of triathlon, like it's unheard of. Now, now you can't compete in the Ironman and in the uh, Olympic distance uh, track simultaneously, the way I was doing back then. Okay. Uh, the whole structure is different. But back then I was doing both long distance and short distance. And even then that was pretty rare. But uh, at that time, there were two qualifiers. There was one at the test event on the course in Sydney. And the top eight ranked Americans were eligible to go to that race. I was a 10th. Um, they got special dispensation for Sheila Termina, who was the ninth race ranked American, and she went. So nine Americans went. I was 10th. So um, I only had one shot, whereas the other nine had two shots. Right. So one person was chosen there. It was the first American across the line, which was Jennifer Gutierrez. So she was our first qualifier. Okay. And then we had that race that you um, read about at the beginning of the podcast, 
on Memorial Day weekend in Dallas, Texas, uh, two people were chosen there. And that was the next two people across the line. Nice. And I was the sec second person across the line. And so uh, the Olympic dream that I never had until two years prior became a reality. Incredible story. Um, so, okay, now we've set the stage, right? <laughs> so that, you know, now uh, we understand the landscape, you know, kind of where you were, how you got where you were going, um, athletically speaking. And, you know, you, so there's so much packed into, uh, especially, you know, psychologically, because I mean, the name of your book, right? A champion mindset, right? Think, I mean, so there's so much packed into what was going on for you during, you know, during that time from, uh, you know, the beginning of your, you know, learning how to swim through to your first um, Olympic qualifier in swimming, uh, through to becoming an amateur and then a professional in the triathlon, through to going to the Olympics, becoming an Olympian, placing fourth in Sydney. So many components that are rarely broken down uh, by most people. They just see the story. They just, you know, I, I read that blurb at the beginning, you know, that vignette. Um, you just kind of gave us an overview, but I want to delve into the mechanics behind what occurs for someone like yourself uh, and other greats and the people that you mentor now, giving the, those words of wisdom to the mechanics, uh, the concepts, the factors that make up a champion. So I'm going to quote you here in the book. Um, there was a time when I used to believe that excellence was primarily based on putting in the work. Those who touched the wall first in swimming or broke the finish tape in a running or triathlon competition just trained harder than everyone else. There is no substitute after all for hard work. At least that's the lesson that was continually drilled into my head during my formative years. At some point though, as I continued to achieve higher and higher levels of success, it occurred to me that the prevailing wisdom was just plain wrong. So I wanna ask you how so? Because what you've described there is, you know, to this day, the mantra for so many in, whether it's in sport, whether it's in um, your career, whether it's in any endeavor uh, where there's, a, there's some sense of victory at the end of the tunnel, um, we all believe what you just suggested there uh, was drilled into you. So when you say that that prevailing wisdom is wrong, you know, tell us what, you know, because this, this is a paradigm shift here. Well, of course, hard work is needed. I have seen plenty of talented athletes not put in the hard work and mm -hmm. not achieve the success. Athletes way more talented than I ever was not achieve the same success. And, and so, yes, you need hard work, mm -hmm. but you also, it's, it's not train until you drop. You know, that was my, my coach that I had when I was in high school. I mean, that was his philosophy, you mm -hmm. know, swim till your arms fall off. Right. And, and, you know, go to you blow or, you know, right. um, no pain, no gain. You know, that, that's sort of the, the prevailing wisdom. But one of the things that I like to tell people is part of mental toughness is also knowing when to stop and when to back off and when to say, hey, I've had enough. Because you see so many athletes get injured and they get burnt out or mm -hmm. they, they lose their edge. And a lot of that comes because they've just trained too hard. And the body can only handle so much. The mind is infinitely malleable. It can handle so much, but mm -hmm. the body can't. Eventually it's gonna break. And it's just gonna say, hey, back off. I need enough. Uh, you know, I've had enough. And, and some people heed that and some people don't. Mm. And there's another component as well uh, beyond listening to your body and what it's telling you and, and knowing you know, when you need to say, hey, I, I need a break. And this, this applies to work as well. I had a conversation with my father just this morning Mm -hmm. telling him, 
you know, I've, I've gone through uh, quite a medical ordeal over the last many weeks. Mm -hmm. And uh, I had some medical testing this morning and I have a, a paper that I have to revise for a journal. And I said to him, you know, I just, I just can't do it. I'm just not motivated right now to do it. And he's like, well, don't, you know, you'll get it done. And so sometimes you just have to know when your body isn't ready to do something and that's okay. And the other component besides knowing when to say when is in the book, one of the common themes among all of the people that I interviewed and the podcasts that I listened to mm -hmm. was joy. They all had joy. And if you don't have joy in what you're doing, you're not going to be successful at it or as successful as you can be. So the prevailing wisdom of just go hard, right? that will take you to a certain level. But you also have to have these other things of, of enjoying what you're doing, like true joy for it. And it's not joy every day. I can't say that every single time I went out to train, I was like, woohoo, I'm going out to train today. This is this is amazing. I mean, I trained in terrible weather. I trained when I wasn't feeling well. I trained when I just didn't feel like it. Mm -hmm. But most of the time I loved what I was doing and I loved racing and I loved the competitors. And, and in the book, you know, a lot of people who went through slumps said that they went through a slump because they lost the joy. And once they got the joy back, they were able to find their stride. And so it's, it's knowing when your body has had too much, and also the joy, yeah. Along with the hard, along with the hard work. Yeah, it's it's funny. Later on, I was gonna, I was gonna ask you about that, um, but I'll I'll ask you about another type of joy, which we'll bring up later. But yeah, that's that makes sense. Um, and you know, it's funny you mentioned about having to do this uh, paper uh, that you're working on uh, publishing, and and how your dad asked you to kind of, well, you know, hey, you can back off. It, it's all right. Um, and I know you you, you mentioned you know, to uh, the audience just now that, you know, you're going through some, some medical issues and you, you and I talking prior to this podcast, um, you know, we're, we're not just talking about some issues. I mean, you've been through hell to put it uh, mildly over the past, you know, 10 or 11 weeks. You've been, I mean, literally through absolute, I mean, I, I can't believe your story is incredible. The fact that we're actually doing this podcast, you have a smile on your face, you have a great attitude, I think really does speak to, you know, to mental toughness. Um, besides the fact that top off all of it, you, you know, you're trying to recover from a surgery. So, um, it really does make sense what you're saying. Um, I want to, okay. Now I want to quote you on something else, um, that you, that kind of maybe, uh, aligns with this concept, um, kind of takes it somewhere else. Again, conventional wisdom. Maybe, maybe shattering some of that conventional wisdom because you say, I knew to dream big, but not dream crazy because even at the tender age of 18, I understood the difference between a realistic goal and a foolhardy goal. The overused adage of you can achieve whatever you want if you try hard enough is the crux of the American dream. We're told from a very young age that we can be or do anything we want. I believe that is false and misleading. You cannot achieve whatever you want. There, I said it. I mean, that's, you know, I mean, that's a hardcore statement. And so I want, I want, to, I want you to delve into that because certainly there have been accomplishments that are outlandish by the standards of most but they get achieved because there have been people that have dared to dream extraordinarily big. Uh, how do you know, Joanna, uh, how do you know that you can accomplish something grand if you don't believe that anything is possible or at least attempt the impossible? So I'd love for you to clarify what this means because, you know, it, this isn't like you're some uh, prognosticator or an armchair uh, quarterback you know, or a critic, you are in the get, you're in the game, professional triathlete, Olympian. So your words carry a lot more weight than the armchair philosopher. I think the human race, any particular individual can do amazing things and have amazing capacities. And, you know, we see it across sports or we see it 
uh, in business. You know, there are business people that have done amazing things and created amazing things. But as a single individual, we all have limitations. Mm -hmm. And, you know, if, let's say I had chosen the sport of running instead of triathlon. Okay. I would not have been an Olympic marathoner. That wasn't going to be my, you know, fate in life. I, I'm not a good enough runner to do that. Um, so we, we, we all have a particular potential that we should be able to maximize, but not all of us are going to be Olympians or right. world record holders or, you know, a LeBron James, you know, he's stands out there on a pedestal because he is who he is mm -hmm. and everybody else in the NBA may aspire to that, but they aren't going to get there because they don't have his gifts. And so when we say that you can do anything you want to do, well, you can try to do anything you want to do, but we all have limitations in what we can do. And so our goal should be, well, what do I think my maximum potential is? And that's what I want to achieve. Got it. So, so it's about, okay, so, you, so in your opinion, from what you've seen and done, it's more about um, identifying your, your true potential and then maximizing it. Is that, is, is that Correct. the case? And not everybody has the same potential. And I'm, a, like, I'm not an artist. And right. I, I could take art lessons and I'll, I'll never be a great artist. That's just, I can maximize whatever art potential I have, but right. it's not going to be very much more than you know, a stick figure. And there are plenty of great artists out there and they're not going to be good runners. So, you know, I think that we need to figure out what our gifts are and try and really hone in on those and be the best we can be at that. I, yeah, I think that's, I, I, that, that's incredibly, it's probably, I mean, maybe this is, maybe this is why the world is littered with, uh, you know, disappointment because, um, you know, you, Everyone wants to, right today. What is it? Everyone wants to be a YouTube star, right? Everyone wants, everyone wants to be a everyone wants to be an influencer. Every right. Everyone wants to be famous for being famous, um, and you know, I think the far harder thing is clearly the far harder thing is to be honest with yourself and assess what is your potential. What are you good at? What are your strengths? What can you become great at? I, you know, I do believe that anyone can be great at something, but I think probably the big challenge is figuring out what the hell that something is, because some people don't figure it out until later in life, much later in life even, but there's always, uh, there's always the opportunity. Uh, but I th again, I think when you break that down, it, it really does make sense. Um, so I want to, I want to ask you then, uh, what exactly is then you know, when we talk about achieving a goal, right, or achieving our objective, what exactly is a goal? You say that when it comes to sports, for instance, but again, I think this applies um, to everything. You say there are three agreed upon types of goals, outcome, process, and performance goals. So um, I'd like to talk about, you know, what, what the, if you could elaborate on that outcome goals, process goals, performance goals. Well, an outcome is, well, let's go back to sports. Uh, okay. And we can use the Olympics as an out, uh, as an example. Okay. Uh, so the, the outcome would be, I want to qualify for the Olympics. Okay. And the, the process is the training that it takes to get there, the skills that you have to hone in order to become an Olympian. And the, the performance is what happened on that day to get you to that finish line to make the Olympics. So of those three, I mean, is there one that's more important than the other or are, are, those, three, are those three goals? Because most people just set outcome goals, which is probably, again, right, the, the thing that leads to uh, to, to failed, uh, you know, to those failed dreams, right? Those also, those, those also rands uh, who never really make it happen because maybe they only focused on the outcome as a goal, but they didn't have a process or couldn't, they couldn't get the process goals achieved uh, or the performance goals achieved. Is any one of those three, in your opinion, more important than the other? 
I think they all interplay together, mm -hmm. but I think that process is very important and it's something that a lot of people ignore. Mm. And for me, I had a lot of ups and downs as an athlete. It wasn't like my trajectory just was a straight line toward the Olympics, you know, mm -hmm. it was like the Rocky Mountains. And even, you know, after the Olympics, becoming a world champion, the same thing. I had a lot of ups and downs. I had some injuries and, you know, mm -hmm. I was, I was, uh, I was in school studying. I couldn't race as much as my counterparts and, you know, it was a rocky road. Um, and so some of my outcomes were not what I wanted, but I loved the process. I enjoyed the training. I enjoyed uh, going out and testing myself on a daily basis. And so if you don't enjoy the process, and we talked about joy, how that's one of the very important right. things in becoming successful, because I enjoyed the process, I was able to deal with the disappointment of not reaching my outcome or a poor performance. And that is what is, has allowed me to have the longevity in sport that I have was because I had all three types of goals and I enjoyed the process. And that sort of mitigated disappointment of, of outcome and performance. Mm. So it, it kind of appears that if you really hone in and work the process goals, that ultimately, you know, if, if you really do learn to master that, you'll have great performances. And if you can continue to have great performances, you'll, you'll reach and, you know, you'll reach your outcome. So it, I mean, just from uh, speaking with you and kind of reading the book and, um, and learning here, it sounds like if you're going to, you know, if you're really going to master one of these, it really starts with process. Is that the case? Oh, it definitely starts with process because you've got to hone skills and you, you know, goals aren't just, I need to achieve X time or I need to place here, or I've got to qualify for the Hawaii Ironman. There's a process that has to come before that. And athletes want to skip the process. You know, they think they're physiologically, you know, it's always funny. I'll get calls from athletes and, you know, I want to qualify for the Hawaii Ironman. Okay, great. Um, I'm a male 40 to 44. And, you know, my time is, you know, maybe an hour off what it should be to qualify. And, oh, by the way, I want to be able to do this in six months. Well, that, that's, that's just not feasible. There's a process that has to happen. And there's, there's, you know, we all have a physiology that isn't that much different from each other. You know, some people have more genetic gifts athletically than others, but physio okay. physiologically still, we all work the same way and our bodies still work the same way. And okay. we have to go through certain processes before we can reach certain achievements. And so, yes, it does start with the process and understanding that and learning the skills and, and putting in the time. And you can't skip over those things. You know, you, you also mentioned that accomplishing a goal requires more than blood, sweat, and tears, that there's also luck, timing, and savvy. Um, let, let's talk about luck and timing a little bit. Um, you know, there's also this... Um, this saying that uh, you make your own luck, right? And that if you're, you know, if you're showing up day in and day out, the timing will, will appear, right? The window will open, albeit for a short period. So it's there. That's your chance to kind of jump through when the window opens, but you got to be there to, to, for it to open. Um, tell, elaborate on this a little bit. When you say there's also luck timing, uh, and savvy. Well, let's talk about the sport of triathlon, where you have the bike, which is the, the bulk of the race. Okay. Well, some of the luck comes in not having a mechanical or a flat tire. And that has derailed many races for many people, myself That's included. True. So, uh, you know, there's, there's, uh, and there's bad luck. I had bad luck at a race where I crashed and it ended my triathlon career. Um, so luck can go in both directions. Uh, timing is important. Um, you know, I came into the sport uh, at the right time. If I had waited another year or two years to turn pro, I would not have been an Olympian. So the, the timing of my turning professional was just right. And savvy comes with understanding all of this and being able to learn the system and understanding the process and just being able to put it all together because you can have luck and you can have timing, you can have hard work, but mm -hmm. you may not be very savvy and you can't put that all together. 
Very, very true. So, I mean, you know, again, these are things that are not often considered because, um, you know, you talk, you, you, you know, you talk about things that are out of your control here when, you know, you, you get a flat tire. Uh, that <laughs> you, you have no control over that for the most part. Uh, if that happens, that's, you know, that's bad luck. Um, obviously, you can, you can train so that you can have that repaired as quickly as possible so that you're not caught unawares. You do talk about that in the book about, you know, you know, not being caught unawares like that and being able to recover from something uh, that is unlucky very quickly. But um, once again, you know, these are, you know, these are f solid, solid points. Uh, weather, weather is one of the biggest things, you know, that, that's something that we have no control over and less so these days. And that really impacts uh, human performance. And certainly you can train yourself to acclimate for heat. Um, less, less easy to do so for the cold. I was not really great in the cooler weather. Um, I don't like to be cold. Uh, right. And so th that's luck right there. You know, you could have wonderful days leading up to a race and then all of a sudden race day is hailing and it's terrible weather. And some people don't have good bike handling skills or they don't do well in the cold. And so there, there are some things that you just can't prepare for. And you just do the best you can in those conditions. Uh, the mm -hmm. Boston Marathon a few years ago, when they had that horrific weather with the wind and the rain, mm -hmm. I mean, the outcome of that race was so different than what it would have been if the weather had been different. And, you know, uh, it, it shows that, you know, you have to be at the right place at the right time. Very true. So, so, if, so I mean, that could be quite maddening for an athlete who has all the gifts, trains, you know, in a process, performance, you know, outcome all dialed in. Um, and then flat tire, weather, things, things that are out of your control. That could be quite maddening for um, someone who is a high achiever because high achievers, whether in athletes or business, are so used to cr controlling the factors of their environment. Um, that's got to lead to levels of stress, which, um, I mean, do, do you find that to be a huge effect because that's out of your control? I mean, I, I didn't find the fact that it was out of my control stressful mm -hmm. per se. Like, you know, I mean, I know that I can't control everything mm -hmm. and, uh, that's fine. I mean, there are variables that just are, you control what you can okay. and then things happen. But certainly, you know, the weather component can be very frustrating um, when you've trained hard for a race and then all of a sudden the weather conditions are conditions that are super not favorable uh, for what your body can handle. That, that's, it's frustrating for sure. Mm. You, um, you say that prior to setting any goals, you, you, you must assess the interplay of five factors, family, health, work, ability and desire can you discuss the interplay uh of those five factors and does achieving a goal depend on and this is really like something i'm interested in in digging into does uh does achieving the goal depend on sacrificing three of those factors at the altar of maybe one or two of them i.e um is there, you know, some equation with respect to having to sacrifice family or health or work to maximize your ability and fulfill your desire for achievement? There's always going to be a sacrifice. I don't think it's possible to have perfect balance of those five things. And having been a coach mm -hmm. uh, and coaching athletes for so many years, you know, coach fam you know, athletes with families, or athletes with high pressure jobs, mm -hmm. something's always sacrificed. Whether people decide, gee, you know, I'm gonna sacrifice time with my family so I can go out on my long bike rides to train for Ironman. That happens, it happens all the time. Mm -hmm. um, it doesn't mean that people decide that they want to um, change jobs or they're not uh, putting as much effort into their job so that they can do their training. See it all the time. Uh, some people, you know, say that they want to, uh, you know, achieve X, but the desire just isn't there. And so they don't put the training in and you see a lot of blanks in their training log 
And so they have sacrificed their desire, even though they say they want this, they just aren't putting the training in. So there's always some sacrifice. And sometimes it's one thing, sometimes it's multiple things. It just depends on the person and what it is they're trying to achieve. You know what? I, that's interesting because later on, I was going to ask you this later on, but I think it's kind of relevant to, for me to bring it up now. Um, you talk about, because you mentioned this, this thing about desire um, and you know, there are people who say they want to do something, but you know, kind of, they, they really, they really want it. They want it badly but they're not willing to make the sacrifices to get it. So you make a point to highlight the critical nature of intention and its relationship to behavior and ultimately performance. And you point out in the book that intention is comprised of three constructs. You, you talk about attitude toward the behavior, perception of the amount of control over the behavior, and perception of the wishes of important others. Can you elaborate? I mean, can you, can you talk about how these three elements influence what you call the, or what you refer to as the intention behavior gap? Because that's what it sounds like we're talking about it. When you talk about desire and then, you know, well, you know, you're not putting in, you know, there's a lot of gaps in your training days in your training diary. Um, what's, let's talk about that, that, that difference between attention uh, and the behavior. You know, it's, it's very ironic because I had a conversation with an athlete today, right before this podcast about this very thing. Okay. And the other thing that we're going to add into this is motivation. Okay. And uh, because motivation sort of also plays a role. And what she said to me was that I want to work out and I want to do these things and I see other people doing these things, but I'm just not motivated. And I just can find a million excuses of why not. And she brought up, you know, somebody who does a lot of training and like, I want to be like her. And I said, well, first of all, you know, she trains too much and there are other psychological issues going on there. That's not mm -hmm. the person that you should be looking toward as uh, your model, your role model. Okay. And in motivation, and I do talk a lot about motivation in the book, intrinsic and extrinsic motivation. Yeah. But, but one thing, and I don't think I mentioned this in the book, is that sometimes you don't need motivation. You just have to take action. And you have to, you know, take the action and make it a habit. And then all of a sudden the motivation comes. And so all these things are tied together with desire. So you may have the desire to achieve something, but for whatever reason, your brain just isn't letting you get there. And maybe it's because you think you lack motivation and you just can't get out the door. And so it just doesn't happen. You don't achieve that goal. And so what I say is to people and what I said to this athlete today mm -hmm. is that just write it in your schedule, in your, in, in your calendar, like you would anything else. Um, at this time, I'm going out for my run. And you treat it like a meeting that you would be going to for work. And you go out for your run and it becomes a habit. And then eventually you're going to be motivated because you, you know how good it makes your body feel. And she did say to me, I have never come back from a workout and regretted it. But for some reason I have trouble getting out the door. Right. And so a lot of it just comes to that. You just have to, it has to become a habit and that motivation isn't always, unless you're injured, you know, sometimes you're not motivated because you know that there's a looming injury somewhere, but let's assuming you're healthy. Okay. And, and so it's, it's really a matter of making a habit of, of getting out the door at the same time, if possible, and, you know, creating something that you look forward to, and then your desire will come. And then you'll start seeing fewer gaps in those workouts. Okay. So I mean, you, you also mentioned this, this thing there about the, the perception of the wishes of important others. Can you clarify that? Well, I think part of the problem also is that people do things because they think it's expected of them or they want to impress other people. Right. Social media has just been horrific for this because people are posting their workouts or <clears throat> they're on Strava or they're on Zwift. And so they're, they're 
either racing somebody else all the time or they see what they've done and they're racing themselves all the time. Right. And uh, you, you know, you want to impress your coach or you want to impress your spouse or you want to impress, you know, your kids or your friends, your training partners. And really the only person you need to impress is yourself. And the one that matters is you and nobody else matters. And, you know, the, you have to be nice to yourself. And, you know, people always say to me, well, what's the one thing about mental toughness that, you know, if you could boil it down, I'm like, well, if I had, a, if I could boil it down, I wouldn't have had to write an entire book. <laughs> but Right. But, the, but the truth is, that if you're going to boil it down to one thing, it's be nice to yourself and don't worry about what other people think because you're doing this for you or you should be doing this for you. Yeah. Yeah. Very, very uh, strong. Yeah. Um, okay. Let, let's talk about the 10,000 hours theory. The, the principle that suggests that 10,000 hours of practice are needed to become world class. So you, you said that you believe the 10,000 hours theory is missing a key component. What is that component? Genetics. Talk to us about this. Uh, well, I think this goes along with some of the things that we talked about earlier is that we all have a potential. And that potential comes from our genes. Not all of us are genetically gifted in certain things. And so yes, you have to put in the hard work and when I look at uh, you know, the number of hours that I put in before I became an Olympian or a world champion, uh -huh. uh, you know, easily 10,000 hours. But clearly I had the genetic capability to be able to do that and the resilience and you know, the ability to overcome the injuries and the, the mental toughness to be able to do all of that. And, and that comes from, you know, some of that is learned but a lot of it's genes. And so if you don't have the genetic gift, I, I don't have the genetic gift to uh, be a basketball player. I'm not tall enough. And so, you know, it's, it's that interplay of putting in the hard work, but also having the genes to be able to achieve a certain level. Do you, uh, a lot of people don't want to hear that, right? So, um, you, you know, it's, what's interesting is up until recently, you know, there's really, it, it would really be quite intuitive for you to get to a place where you understood you didn't have the genetic potential for it. Don't get me wrong. You know, in some cases, it's obvious, right? It's, especially in athletics, it's probably more obvious than in, than in other areas. Um, but even so, um, and given your background, right, genetic counseling, genetic epidemiology, um, we're getting to a place where to read your genome like this and really understand your genetic potential, which would probably allow you to identify what you have the propensity to be great at before you decide to, you know, invest 10 years of your life in a pursuit. Um, so that I think, I, I mean, do you see that as a, um, as a relatively, as a, as a, as a possibility in the, in the short term uh, where, you'll be able to get a genetic workup uh, and where maybe like a 23 and me will be able to kind of give you the opportunity to find out here's the areas where you have uh, the propensity for greatness in the following potential areas. And then, you know, you can then choose from those areas where to really invest your, your, you know, your time, your practice, your skill set, your honing, all of that stuff. Do you see that? Uh, uh, as something that will, that is, that's a future, that's a relative, uh, relatively short term uh, possibility in the future? I don't know if it's short term, uh, maybe eventually. You know, mm -hmm. the, the problem is that it isn't going to be a single gene. There isn't going to be uh, right. a single gene that's going to make you a great athlete. It's going mm -hmm. to be many genes. And mm -hmm. you also have gene environment interactions and you have gene gene interactions. So it's, it's, it's more complex than- It's like epigenetics, right? Right, so it's, it's, it's more, and by the way, David Epstein's book, The Sports Gene is, is marvelous and I highly recommend it where he delves into this whole concept of, of genetics and, and uh, how that plays into sports. But um, you know, I don't know that right now we're at the point where we could do genetic testing and say, you're gonna be good at this 
or you're going to be good at this. Um, there's just, there are too many factors at play. But there is no question that there are genes involved. You know, right? I mean, you know, they talk about uh, and something that uh, David Epstein talks about in his book, The Sports Gene, with, uh, you know, uh, baseball players and, and their visual acuity. Um, you know, that's genetic. Um, I have terrible vision. Um, and uh, right. baseball players have fantastic vision. And, and that's definitely, you know, genetic. Do we know what gene it is, you know, for, for fantastic eyesight? Um, I don't know that we've mapped that yet. Okay. And is it only one gene? Is it many genes? Or, you know, is it also involved with something else? I don't know. And, yeah. you know, and it also brings the question up of genetic doping and, and how people are going to be able to use the human genome for the betterment of human performance, which, you know, eventually will happen. Yeah, it, it, it will happen. I mean, we're, we're already working on how to uh, allow astronauts to live on Mars by manipulating, uh, you know, their, you know, their genes, right? We're, you know, we're looking at what, what, you, what you've just said regarding performance uh, uh, on the battlefield with a uh, super soldier program. We're looking at manipulating genes, uh, you know, for, uh, you know, for the military. Diseases. And there, there, uh, you know, there's gene therapy for various diseases. So, Right, we, we've we got do, CRISPR. Do, right, so we, you know, there is that possibility and it will likely happen. Yeah, it's a very interesting future. Um, I, yeah, I could, but I could absolutely see uh, 23andMe offering the service. <laughs> that's they, a, they, oh, that's a, yeah. a whole, whole new revenue stream, right? Um, At some point. Yeah, well, um, let's, let's talk about um, long-term uh, versus short-term goals. Um, I, you know, I, I think, you know, you mentioned uh, dedication, perseverance, resiliency, not just motivation, uh, but, you know, you, you, you kind of talk about the, you know, the, the, the act of perseverance uh, is, and, and resiliency is also a characteristic of mental toughness. And, you know, where, you know, is that, I mean, that's not necessarily genetic, right? So, I mean, a lot can be overcome, even with mediocre genetics, if you have perseverance, dedication, and resiliency. Um, so, how, you know, how does, how do those things play into long-term versus short-term goals? Well, I think some of it comes down to the fact of creating the realistic goals. Okay. So, you know, you start with that is, you know, yes, you can have goals that are, you know, big, but they still need to be within the realm of realism. Okay. And then you break those down, like you started talking about into, you know, what I call very short term goals, which could be a daily goal. Um, you know, today I want to accomplish this. Uh, you know, for somebody, let's go back to somebody who was the, having trouble getting out the door. Well, so the, the short-term goal could be over the next week or two weeks or month, um, I want to accomplish 90% of my workouts, whereas before I was only doing 60%. So that, that's a pretty short-term goal. Okay. And then, you know, the next goal would be, all right, well, I'm going to sign up for this race and I want to accomplish this in this race with uh, my very long-term goal being that you know, I would like to run a marathon, but right now I'm only accomplishing 60% of my workouts. So there's a lot of steps that have to happen between doing 60% of workouts and then wanting to do this marathon in whatever time. And so where, you know, so number one, you've got to increase your ability to do your workouts. And so that means that you've got to become resilient. Uh, if the weather's crappy, you still have to go outside and uh, you still have to have that desire to want to achieve that goal. And one of the things that I um, talk to athletes about uh -huh. as they're in this pursuit and they're, they're trying to get all of these things to happen is right. I ask them to keep a diary of daily wins. And daily wins could be anything. You know, a daily win could be, I did get out the door today, or a daily win could be, uh, I got my training partner out the door, or a daily win could be, um, you know, I helped somebody at work. It doesn't have to be necessarily, 
related to uh, your sports, mm. but, but something tangible that you can write down. So at the end of the week, you've got seven days worth of daily wins that you can look at and say, wow, I actually accomplished a lot this week. And if you don't write it down, you're not going to remember. And once you start amassing all of these daily wins, your confidence is going to go up, which means your desire is going to go up and your resiliency is going to go up and your ability to achieve your goal now is going to be um, easier. It's, it's going to be more likely to happen because now you've increased your confidence and your self-esteem is going to go up and all of these things are tied together. Yeah, that's massive. I'm a huge believer in, um, in celebrating, you know, the small wins on the way to the big wins. Um, I've, you know, my career has been spent running sales teams and, um, I do something with my sales teams where every day we start the day, uh, with a morning meeting where we talk about what were the wins yesterday, big and small. And then at the end of the week, when we wrap up, what were the week's wins, big and small. And then over, t right, over time, but constantly feeding into that mentality, that psychology of, you know, building upon your wins, right? Stacking wins, stacking wins, that and so you've built a skyscraper, um, it, you know? And that's why I say your book is, is really powerful. Your ideas, uh, you know, are really, really, um, they resonate a across a wider spectrum than just uh, endurance sports or athletics. Uh, but yeah, huge believer in, in that concept. I love it. Um, you say, don't be a chaser. What is a chaser? A chaser is somebody who just, you know, they have a bad race and they say, all right, well, I'm going to try again tomorrow or next week. And then they have another bad race and they, oh gosh, I had a bad, I'm going to have to go to another one. And they just keep chasing this elusive thing that's not there rather than just stepping back and trying to figure out, doing a post-mortem and figuring out what's going wrong. And, and maybe they didn't have enough daily wins. Maybe they didn't concentrate enough on the process. Maybe they only did 60% of what they needed to do, but they don't realize that. But they keep spinning around in a circle and they don't get to where they're going. And so you've I got see. to get off that wheel and step back and figure out what went wrong and how can I make it better? The dreaded hamster wheel. Exactly. <laughs> and we, and we all, we, we've all been on it. We've all chased something. And, you know, it's a matter of understanding why am I not getting where I want to go? And the champions get off the hamster wheel and try and figure it out. Um, you mentioned earlier extrinsic versus intrinsic uh, goals. Can you, can you elaborate that? What, so, you know, what are extrins, uh, extrinsic goals? What are, what are intrinsic goals? Extrinsic, extrinsic goals are goals that are coming from outside of you. Um, so if you're a professional athlete, it's making money or um, achieving awards. Uh, you know, for a lot of the amateurs, it's, uh, you know, beating their opponent or getting accolades on social media. It's, it's things that are outside of yourself. Okay. Uh, I want the t-shirt. I want the medal. I want this. I want that. Intrinsic goals are things that are coming from within you. I love the sport. I want to improve upon my skills. I, I want to get better. I want to see how far I can go. And, you know, it's probably... Uh, you can probably assume which is, is more powerful and maybe you do need both, but you know, for the sake of asking, which of those two are, are more uh, relevant or related to actual achievement? Intrinsic goals are going to get you further. They are. Yeah, I, I believe so. I mean, I think that if you're, if you're having, you know, intrinsically motivated and, and you know, things are coming <clears throat> from within, it helps you handle the disappointment more. So if you are racing for medals or glory or, you know, for pats on the back or kudos, yeah. there's, never, there's never enough. You know, it's like <clears throat> getting likes on Facebook. You know, it's, it's how many is enough? And you get to a point, well, I had 100 likes last week. Now I need 150. And you're always chasing this thing 
that is coming from outside of you that you can't have any control over. So, whereas if it comes from within you, yeah, and 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 you've got the joy and you want to perfect yourself and you want to make yourself better, it just it it is a more powerful way of achieving your goals. And you, I think you end up with more joy for what you're doing. Yeah, I guess this is why. I mean, that's such. I mean, it's really profound if you really think about it because. Um, you hear all the time about people who are successful, who are just not happy. And they're achieving those, those, and it's because they're achieving the extrinsic goals, right? They've got the money, they've got the big house, they've got the big car, uh, they've got the trophy, they got the t-shirt, they're still not happy. Um, and it's most likely because of not fulfilling intrinsic goals. Um, so it's, yeah, I mean, that's, that's really profound. I guess the question always has to be asked of the athlete, or anyone that you're you're coaching or that's striving for something why do you want this right right so what you know why is this important to you um, yeah and if, if, if you're doing it for accolades you, you'll never be satisfied there's just there, there are never enough accolades very interesting um so you so let now mental toughness so you believe that the construct of mental toughness is overused philosophically and underused in practice. And you say mostly this is because mental toughness is generally misinterpreted, rendering true mental toughness hard to find. How so? And I know you boiled it down to one thing, but we don't have to boil it down to one. In fact, in your book, I've never seen more definitions of mental toughness in my life. It's great. I'm definitely going to use some of those with my, uh, with my teams. It's brilliant. Um, but how is mental toughness generally misinterpreted or misunderstood? Well, I think it goes back to something we talked about very early of this whole notion of mental toughness being no pain, no gain. And really, mental toughness is an umbrella. And underneath this umbrella are all of these domains. That, that we've talked about. And it's not one thing. It's so many things that are tied together. And so most people, when you ask them, well, what is my mental toughness? It's, well, it's not giving up. Or it's, uh, I finished that race when I wanted to quit. Or my body was hurting so much, but I was able to push through it. And certainly that is mentally tough, but that is not only what mental toughness is comprised of. It's, it's you know, having the right team around you. It's, knowing when to say when, like I mentioned earlier, that sometimes it's more mentally tough to stop than to keep going. It's, it's, it's having you know, certain levels of um, uh, the, the intrinsic motivation. It's, it's all of these things tied up together. And that's what really makes mental toughness. It's, it's just, it's so big that when you look in the literature and you look for a definition of mental toughness, you can't even find an agreement on what mental toughness is. Well, uh, you know, it's so it, that's interesting because when you look at your list of, of mental, of what some of the definitions of mental toughness or what constitutes mental toughness, you of course talk about, um, you know, some of the, some of the ones that everyone assumes it is right. Um, but you mentioned many, many other things like mental toughness is putting aside the chaos of life for a designated amount of time each day to properly execute your training. Um, here's one of the ones that we assume it is mental toughness is finding that last ounce of energy to keep going until the, until the finish line, when your body wants to quit. Yes. Um, but also you say mental toughness is savoring the small victories and knowing yeah, they will lead daily to wins. Wins, right. So, um, yeah, like this one here, mental toughness is having trust in yourself, your coach and your advisors to lead you down the right path. I mean, you know, no one would ever come up with that definition that, you know, it's a, but it, it's true. If you really think about uh, what comprises, uh, you know, mental, uh, you know, mental toughness, you know, it's very difficult. It's, it's extremely mentally difficult to trust yourself. It's very challenging mentally to tell you got to be tough enough to, or to trust the coach. Cause you might be, I'm, I'm sure you probably deal with this all the time. Athletes that second guess the coach. Right. Yep. I mean, that it is a frustration. 
not, and not, not that I have all the answers and, and I, I like a hearty dialogue with, 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 with my athletes, but ultimately they do need to trust what I'm doing is right for them. Listen, I, you know, it's funny. I, you know, I'm a big fan of the sport of bodybuilding and, um, there's a lot of bodybuilding contests that are taking place right now, professional bodybuilding contests that are leading up to the ultimate, which is the Olympia, right? The one that Arnold Schwarzenegger won back in the day. Um, and it's funny, twice in the last week in listening to the, com the competitors that did well over the last few contests, two very high level competitors both said, you know, I, you know, they, their, their condition changed dramatically from this show that they did to a show that took place a week or two later. And when they were asked, well, what, how did you do that? What was there? There was like, I did nothing. It was my coach. I actually listened to every single thing. I was just a machine, but I trusted my coach implicitly. I, you know, I ate exactly what I was supposed to eat. I trained exactly uh, what was suggested. You know, I slept this amount number out. I drank this much water. You know, I, I, I had, you know, I depleted this much on the sodium and, and put it back in here. So that's incredibly hard to do for high achievers because they, they think they know better or they don't trust. So yeah, that's a, so again, you just have a lot of very interesting definitions of what mental toughness, is, you know, is truly made up of. Um, and that's, that's why I say it's an umbrella with so many things underneath it and that it's not what people think it is. Mm. Can I ask you, you also, you also mentioned self handicapping. Mm. What, what, this is really cool. Um, you, you, you say the no excuse protocol. <laughs> Talk about this concept of self self handicapping. What is that? I, ha I, ha I have to say, that was the fav my favorite term that I found when I was researching the book. I noticed. Uh, I had never heard of the, the, the terminology self-handicapping. And I'm doing literature, you know, I'm searching on making excuses and, you know, I can't find anything. <laughs> and I don't know even know how I stumbled upon the term self-handicapping. But <clears throat> essentially self-handicapping is making excuses. So it's the person that comes to the workout and says, <sighs> I am not going to have a good day today. I am so tired from my workout yesterday or gee, my legs are just shot. I lifted really hard yesterday. So I'm just going to have a terrible run today or before a race. My taper just didn't go well. I'm, I'm going to have a terrible day today. And it's people basically making excuses before something happens so that if it doesn't go well, it's already there in the bank. They've already, mm. they've already made the excuse. So this and it happens all the time. So this isn't making excuses for why you didn't uh, achieve the goal. This is pre, like uh, pre-excuse, right? So you said so the, the self-handicapping. So, um, you know, kind of setting the stage for failure so that if you fail, your, your ego isn't crushed or expectations, um, you know, that haven't yep, been this, The excuse was already there. It's already ready-made. So, so it's already ready-made for social media. So you found a correlate, have you found a correlation between the level of self-handicapping and people who don't succeed? Um, I don't, I mean, I haven't <clears throat> looked specifically uh, at that, but, okay. um, but based on experience, I would probably say yes, that if you already are going into something thinking that you're not going to um, achieve what you want, it's uh -huh. going to be a lot more difficult to achieve it. And if you've already given yourself an out, it's yeah. going to be much easier to give in. Right. So is that that old, uh, what was, who, who burned the bridge or burned the boats? Right. When they, when they, so they couldn't, they, they you know, was it the conquistadors? I think they, uh, when they got to the Americas, they burned the boats so that they couldn't go back. Uh, but it's um, also that concept of the uh, burn the bridges, like burn the bridge because now you have no choice or is that also in your opinion, you know, then you get back into that whole thing about, um, you know, just an impossible goal. Like you, you could, you know, you, you could be happy just smashing your head against the wall um, and your head's going to break before the wall because you, you, you haven't recognized that this is not what you're, what, what you're good at. I mean, it's a very fine line. Um, 
Do you find that? I think people self-handicap for a variety of reasons, but I would say the main reason is to protect their ego. Ego protection. So, yeah. Self-preservation. Self-preservation. Uh, absolutely. I, you know, self-preservation even, uh, even affects high achievers. Um, it is, uh, an ego drives a lot of self achievers. So it's, I mean, I don't think it's, uh, it's much of a surprise. You also talk about, um, not being a perfectionist, right? And this is really hard for the go-getters out there, the strivers, uh, the high achievers you, with regards to perfectionism, you discuss two types, uh, personal standards, perfectionism and evaluative concerns, perfectionism. Who knew there were two types? <laughs> Can you define those two uh, for us? Um, I don't actually uh, remember specifically uh, the definitions between let me those. Here, let me, let me, okay. yeah, let me give them to you. And if then, if you could yeah. kind of explain the I'll importance. Talk, yeah. Yep. So personal standards perfectionism uh, is self-oriented striving for perfection and setting high personal standards. Uh, and then you talk about evaluative concerns perfectionism, uh, which is concerns over mistakes, doubts about actions, concerns about how others view your performance. So like, you know, when you, when you say don't be a perfectionist, um, you know, if you can put that in context of these two different types of perfectionism, is perfectionism in any of these cases a good thing or striving for it? You know, whether it's high personal standards or whether it's being concerned over making mistakes. Perfectionism, I think, is, um, can be very negative. And ironically, one of the things I have found uh, mm -hmm. in doing... Um, a lot of mental skills coaching is that there is an inverse correlation between perfectionism and mental toughness. And mm. that people who um, are perfectionists generally tend to score lower. I actually um, developed a, what I call the Sisu quiz. Okay. Uh, Sisu is the Finnish word for grit. And uh, the link for the quiz is in the book. And people who score uh, in the lowest strata of mental toughness are usually perfectionists. Wow. And this happens, I mean, every single time. Uh, particularly, I see this a lot with uh, teenage girls. Okay. And they actually, um, they do very well in school. Um, often they're straight A students. Mm -hmm. uh, they're, they're very good athletes, mm -hmm. but they have very low self-esteem. They have very low confidence. So a lot of the domains of mental toughness that are tested in that CSU quiz, um, they score low on. And the problem is because when you strive for perfectionism and right. when you want to be perfect, there's no such thing. You can't be perfect. And so what I say to people is a mantra that I want them to repeat. I'm not perfect because nobody's perfect. All I have to do is try hard. And when I have them say this, and have them repeat it. And even with adults, you know, uh -huh. I do this with kids, with adults. Um, I ask them, how do you feel after you say that? And they always say to me, gosh, that feels really weird. And I say to them, well, is it liberating? And they say, yes. And I say to them, write this down and tell yourself this all the time because robots aren't perfect. Our computers aren't perfect. Right. Nothing is perfect. And as human beings, we are imperfect. We make mistakes. And so if you're striving to be perfect, you're going to constantly be disappointed. And of course, that's going to make your confidence go down and your self-esteem go down. So yes, you have to try hard and you want to hone your skills, but you're never going to be perfect. You're, there's always, I mean, you, let's take basketball, for example. And I keep bringing up yeah. basketball because my husband has it on every single day right now. <laughs> Right. But, you know, they don't make every free throw and there's nothing impeding them and they're being paid millions of dollars and they're standing there and there, there's no reason why they should miss. Yet they do because they're not perfect and there's just no such thing as perfect. And so that's why perfectionism ends up being almost inversely correlated with mental toughness. That is revelatory. Um, it I'm is not, for a lot of people. It really is. Um, 
you would not on the surface assume that under under any, under any circumstances but now really if you're if you're truly thinking about it you can see how such a thing shakes gnaws at and renders mental toughness asunder because it, it produces you know the the chase for something that's unattainable like perfectionism produces so much uh negativity and doubt and um you're constantly questioning yourself that uh i, I there's at all like one of the things I relate this to is when, you know, you're always like um, entrepreneurs are or budding entrepreneurs are always waiting for the perfect time to start their business. But successful entrepreneurs will tell you there is no perfect time and that you got to build the plane while you're in flight. Right. But if you're a perfectionist that you're, you're never getting off the ground. There is no flight. There is uh, exactly. I'm, Right. So, yeah, that's really, really interesting. Um, I'm going to share that, that link to that, uh, that, that test uh, in, the, uh, in the show notes. Um, so you also talk about the confidence cycle. Um, you know, you have, I believe, a chapter on confidence or you certainly highlighted in the book. Um, and you say that confidence perpetuates confidence, but I want to ask, in your opinion, from what you've seen, again, your coach uh, to many, many athletes, um, how does one develop confidence in the first place if well, you don't have it or you if get like, rid you're of, looking you get, for you get, it? You get rid of perfectionism. So a lot of people that are lo have low confidence are perfectionists and they wow. can't achieve that. Wow. Other is something we already talked about is the daily wins and keeping track of that. Okay. Because when you amass a lot of daily wins, your confidence is gonna go up. And the, the other thing um, is teaching somebody something so that if you're expert in something and you can teach somebody else how to do it, you're going to feel more confident. So you just have to boost yourself up. Incredible. And once you start boosting yourself up, the confidence comes more easily. But I would say probably one of the, one of the biggest things that derails confidence is perfectionism. Wow. Wow. This, I'll tell you what, I haven't, so, you know, I talk about um, how to develop confidence um, and I've heard a lot of people explain conf how to, how to uh, cultivate confidence. I've never heard what you've just said there. I think that's brilliant. So your prescription threefold, one, don't be a perfectionist Two, stack the, the celebrate the small wins, right? Stack the wins. Yep. Three, teach somebody something. Yes. That's brilliant. I, it's true. Um, you know, I've, I've always said that if you can teach someone, you yourself strive to be better because now you're all of a sudden responsible for kind of showing someone how to do something the right way or in the best way possible. So now you have to be, you have to make sure, wait a second, I have to be credible here. So you, you now end up honing your own skills even further. It, that's great. That's a wonderful prescription for developing confidence. Pra and it's practical advice. It's not uh, just, uh, you know, all this punditry and plauditry and uh, euphemisms. That's great. Um, all right. I'm, I want to ask you one more question before we get into what you're up to now. Um, the joy of risk. You've talked about joy. You mentioned joy a lot being, actually, there's two more things I want to ask you. Sorry. <laughs> but, um, you, you, joy is a big thing. Um, I, I get it. Um, it makes so much sense. What's the joy of risk? Because a lot of people don't find any joy <laughs> in taking risk. It's, you know, even for those that do, they take calculated risks or they, they take a risk. Not, they don't want to take the risk, but they know they've got to take a risk in order to succeed. You talk about the joy of risk. Explain. Well, in order to be able to find joy in taking risk, you have to shed the fear of failure. And I don't even like the word failure. I, I okay. kind of try and take that out of people's vernacular. Okay. And I like to call it unfinished business. Because if you've tried something and you haven't succeeded, you haven't failed. You just didn't achieve what you wanted. And maybe you'll get it the next time. And so 
you know, failure is not even starting or attempting. And so, you know, you can have a mechanical failure, you know, when you have that flat tire we talked about, yeah, there was a failure on your bike. But if you went out there and you tried hard and you still didn't achieve your goal, you didn't fail, you just didn't have the day you wanted. And so I was definitely a risk taker. I would go hard. I would blow up in races sometimes. I had a lot of races I didn't finish. I was okay with that. Um, you know, uh, my ego was okay with, with um, not doing well on, on a big stage. Now, I would not to say that I wouldn't be upset and, you know, have to do a post-mortem and certainly shed many tears, but I was okay with taking risks because if you don't take risks, you're not going to be able to find out where your limits are and what your potential is. And so if you're always behind that line, that's where you're always going to stay. And if you're, you know, willing to say, hey, I'm just going to step over that line. Like when I first started coaching, that was a risk. I didn't know if I would be able to coach athletes. I didn't know if I could get people to their goals. I didn't know if people would listen to me. I didn't know if I had the uh, capability of giving people the workouts they needed. I was, you know, am I going to overtrain them? Am I going to get people injured? You know, there's all sorts of things that went through my mind when I started coaching. But I wanted to help other athletes. So I took the risk. And, um, you know, and, and here I am 15 years later, I'm still coaching. Wow. And so you've got to take risks if you want to achieve whatever it is you want to achieve. And rather than looking at it as an adversary, you have to look at it as a friend. Unfinished business. Unfinished business. It's great. It's great. Um, okay. Last question. Then, then we'll talk about um, your, your research into, uh, into cannabis. Um, so hope. Let's talk about the power of hope. So you mentioned that hope uh, is not an insignificant paradigm, that uh, hope has been associated with higher proficiency in life, superior coping mechanisms, increased positive thoughts, less depression, better outlook during stressful events. I guess what I want to ask you is for many people out there, um, I guess it's like kind of like confidence, right? It's like, well, I'm not, you know, if you're not confident, how do you find confidence? For a lot of people who are not in um, having, I mean, right now is a perfect example, right? You have the, the, the COVID pandemic, you have a lot of people out of work, you have a lot of people losing their businesses, people who are ill, you know, all the of these West, issues. The, the, the West is on fire. The right, the, 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 right, the West is on fire. I mean, there's, a, you know, 2020 is, you know, one hell of a, a year. Um, so for those people that don't see any hope, like given how important it is and, and how it is associated with so many incredible things in someone's life, is there a way to find hope? kind of like you can cultivate confidence. How do you cultivate hope? You know, it's funny you ask. Now, I had a terrible bike accident many years ago, okay. almost 11. And um, I sustained terrible injuries that kept me off the bike. Um, I, I did permanent damage to my rib cage, both structural, neuropathic. I've had a lot of surgeries on my rib cage. And I stopped riding a bike. It was, it was just too painful. I just, it wasn't that I was afraid to ride. Mm -hmm. I, was, I was in pain. Like I just, I couldn't bend over. Um, my balance has become affected um, from my injuries. And so I didn't ride anymore. But um, I uh, sustained a, a really bad injury in my leg. And that required the surgery that you mentioned that I had not that long ago. Right. And I knew as part of my recovery from my surgery that I was going to have to ride a bike, a spin bike. So I purchased a spin bike okay. and um, I'm going to, uh, I don't know if you can see my spin bike right here. Can yes. you see it? Yes. Do you know what I named my spin bike? Cause I name I name all my stuff. I named it hope. <laughs> so, you, <laughs> so you found hope. <laughs> I found hope. So, you know, in the midst of this uh, shit storm of health woes that I had, I purchased this bike and I named it hope. And I think the way you find hope is that you just, it's like a seedling. It's anything that you can grasp onto and let it grow from there. It could be the smallest little thing. It doesn't have to be a big thing. It can be anything at all. 
just the tiniest little thing to grasp onto and let it bloom from there. And for me, during this time of, of hell that I went through with this, all this medical stuff, mm -hmm. and I got this bike, I knew that this bike was going to be my salvation in some way. And so I named it Hope. It's incredible. That's right. I should end the podcast on that. It's such a great ending to the story. But <laughs> you're doing some incredible stuff right now um, with the Canna Research Group. So you're the CEO of Canna Research Group or um, Canna Research Foundation. Um, can you tell us about the, the, the work you're doing on cannabis and um, how it relates to pain mitigation and how it can help athletes uh, as well as anyone that, that are facing, you know, certain issues uh, where, uh, you know, cannabis might be, uh, you know, their salvation. Can you talk a little bit about um, the work that you're doing? Sure. So uh, we formed a Canner Research Foundation, or the Canner Research Group initially. Okay. Uh, <clears throat> did a, uh, I got interested in cannabis because of my own personal cannabis use. Okay. Uh, I mentioned that I had this terrible accident that left me with uh, severe neuropathy. Yes. And I, I, get, uh, I have pain and muscle spasms. I get lack of appetite. It's hard to sleep. Whole host of issues. And traditional pharmaceuticals weren't giving me the complete relief that I was seeking. Okay. And as a uh, professional athlete, cannabis was not legal. And also, I was working as a research associate at the Institute for Behavioral Genetics at CU, and I was studying drug abuse in adolescents and young adults, and one of the drugs we studied was cannabis. Okay. I actually had a very negative attitude toward cannabis. It was a huge stigma. Interesting. But, but my husband encouraged me to try it. I live in Colorado. It was legal here medically for quite some time, and I had a medically qualifying condition, okay. but the stigma was too much. And when it became legal recreationally, it lifted one of the stigmas. I didn't have to get a prescription for it. Okay. And so I went to the dispensary and I tried some cannabis and I found it helpful. And I started as talking to other cannabis users who were using it medically. And I kept hearing all these wonderful stories of how it helped them. And I looked at the literature and found that there really wasn't a lot about the medical benefits of cannabis. Most of the research, and still is today, um, very negative, looking at the negative aspects and how it can affect the brain and how it affects this and that. And, you know, there's more research, you know, looking at how it can be used medically. But uh, a few years ago, when I started my work in cannabis, there was really not much at all. Okay. And as an epidemiologist, I decided, well, I'm in a position to study cannabis and really look at it in an unbiased manner, looking at um, the adverse effects, but also the beneficial effects. Okay. And the first study we did happened to be an athlete's, called it the Athlete Peace Survey. Peace meaning pain, exercise, and cannabis experience. Okay. And uh, through the success of that study, I formed Canner Research Group. And, uh, and most recently now, we have formed a nonprofit Canner Research Foundation. Uh, where we're studying cannabis in uh, various diseases, uh, looking at patterns of use, harms and benefits, uh, doing surveys uh, to see how we can most effectively get people who want to use cannabis for their ailments uh, to help them with pain and insomnia, anxiety, uh, whatever medical conditions they're facing. There's just so much that we don't know. We don't know what dosages people should be taking. We don't know how frequently. Okay. We don't know how much THC. We don't know how much CBD. Um, a lot of physicians don't know about cannabis. So we're working on studies on um, surveying physicians to learn about their knowledge with our ultimate goal of being able to provide evidence-based education to both patients and physicians and to the industry so that people can learn how to use cannabis effectively and safely. So do you see um, this eventually becoming something that, because you know, it's less and less now a stigma for, for people uh, to use to mitigate pain, inflammation, uh, anxiety, um, you know, certainly with, with a host of chronic diseases as well, there, you know, there seems to be some correlations that we're seeing, uh, you know, certainly, I mean, if you're talking cancer, um, you know, just the side effects of nausea alone, um, you know, are quite staggering for people on chemotherapy. 
Um, there were even studies, uh, they're even doing studies, I believe, with, on THC uh, mitigating tumor growth because of angiogenesis uh, and cutting off the, the tumor's blood supply. So, I mean, there's all, there's all kinds of research going into the uh, medical benefits of cannabis. But what I find interesting beyond that is its use, is its use as, I don't know if you want to call it a performance enhancer for athletes, but certainly in the recuperative uh, aspect of being an athlete that trains the way you train uh, and the way a lot of professional athletes have to train where they're really pushing their bodies to the brink. Um, has it been shown that, that cannabis um, can help with the recuperative process? Um, you know, and also, I mean, you know, I think you mentioned mitigating pain, but what about helping athletes recuperate from intense training? Well, when we studied our athletes and we asked whether or not they thought it was a performance enhancer, very few answered yes. I think maybe 11% of people who okay. used cannabis said that they felt that it improved their performance. I think that perhaps indirectly it can be a performance enhancer um, because yeah. if it improves your sleep or it decreases your anxiety or you know, it helps right. your, if you have um, pain and it decreases pain, uh, then maybe indirectly it's improving performance. But I don't view that as being any different than people who are using ibuprofen or are right. doing, you know, um, massage or other modalities to heal from whatever it is that they're doing training wise. You know, I think it's just one tool in an arsenal of many tools and that perhaps cannabis is safer than some of the other medications that athletes are taking. Uh, for things like anxiety or for sleep or for pain or for, um, you know, certainly, you know, non-steroidals. Are you seeing um, either anecdotally or within the studies, within your research, are you seeing an increase in the use of cannabis by top level amateur and professional athletes? Anecdotally, yes. Uh, we haven't done... Uh, longitudinal studies, you know, to look over time in the same group of people to see, you know, people who are not using it currently, if they start using it. Mm -hmm. But anecdotally, I would say yes, that, that more athletes are starting to use it. I think one of the, I mean, certainly in the, in the world of uh, over-the-counter supplements, you're seeing a ton of uh, marketing around CBD for, um, you know, for training. Everything. Right. <laughs> for everything. <laughs> for everything. Um, I think it's being marketed, uh, you know, to, to athletes with respect to its um, anti-inflammatory properties, if I'm, if I'm correct. But um, do you, you know, again, I know you mentioned how right now no one really knows what the optimal doses are with respect to THC versus how much CBD. But um, are you... Um, are you, are you aware of the benefits, uh, the measurable benefit, benefits of CBD or high CBD to very low THC cannabis products when it comes to um, training and the, the side effects of training, perhaps injuries, perhaps mitigating inflammation? Well, I'm going <clears> to, <throat> I'll say a couple of things. Number one, okay. it's very, very personalized. Everybody medicine in general, you know, is personalized. Everybody responds differently to medicine. Okay. And cannabis is no different. So one person's five milligrams of THC could be another person's 50 milligrams of THC. <laughs> and so, right. you know, each person sort of needs to figure out what works for them. Okay. The other thing is that for people that are using CBD, uh, it needs to be carefully sourced where you're getting it because a lot of studies have shown mm. that what is on the label is not what is in the bottle. Mm. So if you're using CBD and you're not purchasing it at a dispensary where it's been tested by a third party tester, make sure that you're getting it from something reputable that's been tested by somebody like consumer labs always does every year. They do a report uh, where they will purchase a whole bunch of CBD and make the re recommendations. Okay. So really source your CBD from somewhere that has a certificate of analysis that is valid and true and that you know what you're getting. The other thing is 
um, I would say that most people are not taking therapeutic doses of CBD, that maybe they're taking a few drops of it. And a lot of the studies that they do, they're yeah. taking way more than that. So we don't know what the therapeutic dose is, and, and it's going to vary from person to person. So if, you know, the, the mantra, the thing that people say in the world of cannabis is start low, go slow. So <laughs> whatever dose you start at, right. keep a record of what you're doing. And if it's not working for you, it doesn't mean that it doesn't work. It just means that either A, you're not taking enough or you're not using the right product, or maybe you need a little THC with your CBD. There's something called the entourage effect, where it's the, the whole plant that okay. is really the effective. But if you're getting drug tested, um, there's always a concern of THC showing up or being over the limit. So if you're being drug tested, please be careful. Um, you don't want to test positive. Um, so there, there's a lot of issues involved with using cannabis uh, so people need to use it responsibly and they need to find what works for them. Do the, um, do the elite level uh, sports associations uh, test for a cannabis? Is that something like, for instance, is that a banned substance? Is cannabis a banned substance? It's, it, it's what's called a threshold drug. So CBD is allowable. Okay. And THC is allowed in your, if you're in the WADA, if you're within the WADA signatories. Right. So if you're like in the Olympic sports, so we're not talking about NBA, NFL, yeah, NHL. Yeah, yeah. Um, but if you're within the WADA umbrella, um, you're allowed to have THC up to a certain level, but it's banned in competition. It's banned in competition. Right. But, but you can't, but if you, have it in your system below a certain threshold, okay. it will not be a positive test. Very interesting. Now, that, is that THC? What about CBD? CBD is legal. They don't test for that anymore. Okay. So CBD, completely legal, and THC up to a certain limit within the system. Correct. Very interesting. And WADA is the world... Uh, Anti-doping. Doping, Anti-doping association? Yes. Agency? Uh, I, I, something something yeah. like that, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. One. Um, very, very interesting. Are, um, I don't know if you are or you're not, but, you know, coaches uh, that are really, uh, you know, pushing their athletes, uh, especially athletes that are, we're not just talking about the athlete that wants to improve their performance. We're talking about the athlete that wants to compete in high level amateur or even professional level uh, sports, our coaches, um, and again, we're not talking NFL or NBA here, right? But our coaches beginning to prescribe or suggest um, along with their nutrition programs and their supplement programs, our coaches starting to um, uh, suggest CBD as part of their regimen? I don't know. Okay. <laughs> I, I mean, I, I, just, I just don't know what other coaches are doing. I mean, I know that a lot of athletes will email me or call me and ask me about, you know, CBD, and I will tell them just what I told you. Um, what, you know, low and slow? <laughs> low and slow, use it, you know, if you're going to use CBD, source it well. Okay. Um, if you're going to be drug tested, you probably should not use THC because, um, you know, you can't say what level, everybody metabolizes it differently. And right. so it's, you can't say, well, if you use this much, you'll be below the level. Um, and you don't want to have a positive drug test, although I do know a lot of professional athletes that, that use it, uh, but use it at your own risk. Um, so, you know, there's a lot of positive, positives and negatives when it comes to cannabis. What is your goal with uh, the cannabis research group? What, it, what, is, what is your goal? More studies, more information. Uh, I want to be able to learn more to give people more solid information on how to use it effectively. And that's not just athletes now, that's across the board? So uh, we just finished a study uh, that I'm in the process of analyzing the data. We did a study looking at cannabis use in people with asthma and allergies. Uh, we put in a grant uh, that I'm working collaboratively with a, another group. Uh, for looking at people with rheumatic diseases. Uh, so we want to really look at cannabis use in a, a variety of ailments. And uh, we're also uh, looking to do other, other initiatives with athletes. Powerful, powerful. 
Okay. Uh, so last question. Uh, because you've been very kind with, with your time. Uh, thank you so much. Uh, you know, you talk about uh, confidence, you talk about hope, how important these things are. I love what you talk, I loved your prescription for gaining confidence. I loved um, how you found hope, right? It's, you know, planting the seed. Um, you talk about motivation right? Motivation being important. Um, what motivates you? I mean, you've just been through, you know, hell as you've described it. Um, how do you stay motivated? Because, you know, again, throughout this podcast, if you didn't mention all the pain you've been in, all the suffering, all the, the and you've had lots of inju injuries throughout your career. I mean, if you read your book, you could see what you've gone through. Um, but even just recently, those, these last 10 or 11 weeks, yet you're smiling, you're upbeat. No one would know that you've gone through all this stuff. Where do you find, where do you find your motivation? Where do you find your inspiration? Well, I think my answer today is different than it would have been during my time as an athlete. Okay. But my, my motivation now with the research I do and the coaching I do is I want to help other people. I want to, I want to make other people's lives better so that they don't have to suffer. Powerful. Yeah, that's great. That's, an, that's, uh, that's a very, very compelling purpose, uh, you know, to have in life. And uh, I could certainly see how that would uh, inspire uh, someone like yourself. Uh, Joanna, where can our audience find out more about you? Uh, where can they, where can they follow you? I don't know if you have, uh, if you want to talk about any social media or some of your websites, I know you have a few, where, where can our listeners find you to learn more? Um, on Twitter, Joanna Zyger, uh, Instagram, same. Okay. Uh, you can find me, find me on Facebook, um, website, joanna-zyger.com. Um, if you want to learn more about our cannabis work, it's uh, cannaresearchfoundation.com. If you want to learn more about coaching, it's racereadycoaching.com. And uh, I'll send you all of those to put in the show notes. Yeah, please do. Uh, we'll get it all in the, uh, it, you know, in the show summary. And Joanna, thank you so much for spending time with us. Uh, your uh, insights are absolutely fabulous. Um, the book, again, I highly recommend it for uh, not just athletes, but for anyone in business, because the, the lessons and the insights uh, that you discuss are applicable in so many ways to so many things. So uh, I, I greatly appreciate you uh, sharing your, uh, your experiences with us. Well, thank you so much for having me. This has been a fun chat. Thank you. Take care.